Welcome to NTD News Today. And here are today's top stories. The U.S. is pushing for calm and a Gaza ceasefire after Hezbollah terrorists launched hundreds of rockets and drones at Israel. Israel's military says about 100 fighter jets struck targets in Lebanon to thwart a larger attack. One of Russia's biggest attacks against Ukraine in weeks. Hundreds of drones and missiles were fired at regions spanning across half the country. The impact of the attack on the nation. Vice President Kamala Harris heads to Georgia with running mate Tim Walz this week. And Robert F. Kennedy Jr. responds to some family members criticizing his support for former President Trump. The latest on the presidential race. The body of a hiker killed in the Grand Canyon flash flooding was found, and the Arizona National Guard airlifts more than 100 others to safety. Plus, in Hawaii, Hurricane Hone dumps a foot or more rain on the Big Island. Germany vows to step up deportations in the wake of a terror attack that killed three and injured eight. We have more on the attack and the suspect. And Paris marks the 80th anniversary of liberation from the Nazis. One woman shares her memories of the aftermath of World War II. This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Good morning. Happy Monday. I'm Stephanie Cox. And I'm Don Ma. How are you doing, Steph? I'm pretty well today, Don. Thanks so much. I was reading about the benefits of coffee and chocolate last night, so I made full use of that this morning. Oh, really? So you're feeling extra good there with that? <laughs> Absolutely. Extra good. All right. All right. Let's get back into the top news. The White House says it's working to avert an escalation after an exchange of strikes between Israel and Hezbollah. And the Iran-backed terrorist group launched hundreds of rockets, actually, and Steph, uh, and these were drones as well at, at Israel yesterday. Yeah, Israel's military says about 100 of its fighter jets struck thousands of Hezbollah rocket launcher barrel barrels. It followed with further attacks later in the day. This comes after Israel killed a top Hezbollah commander last month in Beirut. He was accused by the U.S. of orchestrating a 1983 bombing that killed more than 240 troops. Hezbollah says yesterday's attack was the first phase of its retaliation. And just adding to that, high-level Gaza ceasefire talks are still underway. The Hamas delegation left negotiations in Cairo yesterday. The terrorist group says it only wants to implement President Biden's earlier proposal for a deal. Meanwhile, the top U.S. general has started and announced a visit to the Middle East. Let's now go to Entity's Jeremy Sandberg, who has the update on the U.S. response. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says the U.S. is working to avert an escalation of conflict in the Middle East. This after the Lebanese terrorist group Hezbollah launched hundreds of rockets and drones at Israel yesterday. Israel's military said about 100 jets preemptively struck targets in Lebanon to thwart a larger attack. Hezbollah's leader said the Iran-backed terror group was assessing the impact of its strikes. He said the group would respond another time if the result is not enough. This is not the end of the story. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu said yesterday, Israel's air defense has intercepted all of Hezbollah's rockets and drones. He said leaders of Hezbollah and Iran should know Israel's reaction was another step towards changing the situation in the north and returning residents safely to their homes. We are hitting Hezbollah with surprising thrusts. Three weeks ago, we eliminated his chief of staff, and today we foiled his offensive plan. Air Force General C.Q. Brown began his trip to the Middle East in Jordan on Saturday. Brown traveled to Egypt yesterday, hours after the Israel-Hezbollah cross-border exchange. Egypt's president warned a major conflict in Lebanon would threaten the security and stability of the entire region. Brown is visiting Israel next. He said a Gaza hostage ceasefire deal would help bring the temperature down if achieved. Iran has vowed to strike Israel after a top Hamas leader was killed in Tehran. The U.S. military has been bolstering its forces in the Middle East. The Abraham Lincoln Carrier Strike Group is in the region to replace the Theodore Roosevelt Carrier Strike Group. The U.S. has also sent an F-22 Raptor squadron and deployed a cruise missile submarine. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. And with all of that in mind, the U.S. is now taking extra steps to protect its citizens in Israel after those strikes happened. The U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem issued a security alert warning Americans that they should exercise caution. As well, Steph, the, emb the embassy's alert noted that uh, the attacks often take, pl take place without any warning. It also stated that it's important to know the location uh, of the nearest shelter right. as well. 
uh, the U.S. government employees and family members might be ordered to shelter in place. And Russia today launching drones and missiles into Ukraine. That's as a Russian spokesperson says that Ukraine's recent offensive into the country will be met with a Russian response. Ukraine launched a surprise attack on the Kursk border region in Russia earlier this month. Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov today called the offensive a hostile action, saying Russia has to respond accordingly. Peskov dismissed media reports saying that there had been ceasefire negotiations between Moscow and Kyiv. He says the topic of negotiations is re relevant now after Ukraine's incursion. And Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky today said that Russia launched one of its biggest strikes on Ukraine yet. He said over 100 drones and 100 missiles were fired toward Ukraine. Like most previous Russian strikes, this one is just as sneaky, targeting critical civilian infrastructure in the majority of our regions, in Kharkiv as well, the Kiev, Odessa and western regions. Unfortunately, there are casualties. At least three people were killed in the attack. Thirteen others were wounded. The barrage reportedly began around midnight and continued into the early hours of this morning. The strikes affected 15 regions, more than half the country. Zelensky says the missiles and drones caused a lot of damage to Ukraine's energy sector. He added that restoration works are underway. Ukrainian officials are again calling on allies to let Kyiv strike deeper into Russia using long-range weapons. They say that's to attack the places from which Russia launches its missiles. Reuters said a member of its team was killed in a strike in eastern Ukraine. It could not say if Russia was responsible. Here's the latest from the war. In a statement, Reuters said safety advisor Ryan Evans was killed yesterday after a missile struck the hotel where he was staying. Two Reuters journalists were being treated in a hospital. One of them was seriously injured. The news agency said it was urgently seeking more information about the attack and working with Ukrainian authorities. Evans was a former British soldier who had been working with Reuters since 2022. He advised journalists on safety around the world, including in Ukraine, Israel, and at the Paris Olympics. He was 38. In a statement, Reuters said, quote, Ryan has helped so many of our journalists cover events around the world. We will miss him terribly. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said the hotel was hit by a Russian missile. He suggested the strike was intentional. A regular city hotel was destroyed by a Russian Iskander missile, absolutely purposefully, in a thought-out way. Seven people were wounded and one died in this strike. My condolences to friends and families. And this is everyday terror which still goes on because Russia has the means to continue. The Russian Defense Ministry did not respond to a request for comment. Reuters was not able to independently verify if the missile that hit the hotel was fired by Russia or if it was a deliberate strike on that building. Speaking to journalists Sunday, Zelensky said former President Trump has signaled his support for Ukraine. The remarks came after Zelensky held bilateral talks with Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. During the war time, yes, we had one phone call. So. I only had messages that he will support Ukraine and will do everything how to stop the war and uh, to do everything Ukraine be independent, European and, and free. free. So that's all messages I've got from him but, but di directly. On Sunday, Ukraine and Russia exchanged 115 prisoners of war. This marked the 55th swap between the two sides since the start of the war in 2022. The United Arab Emirates moderated the exchange. The country's foreign ministry said the UAE's efforts have facilitated the exchange of more than 1,700 prisoners. Ukraine said many of the liberated prisoners had severe health problems caused by their injuries. On the country's 33rd Independence Day set Saturday, Ukraine once again called for restrictions on using long-range western May weapons to be lifted. The U.S. has added more than 100 Russian and Chinese firms to a trade restriction list. That's over their alleged support for Russia's military. About 40 Chinese companies were added to the list, along with 60 from Russia. Roughly 20 firms were targeted from other countries. Reasons for being blacklisted include sending U.S. electronics to Russian military-related entities and producing drones for Russia to use in Ukraine. Many of the companies added to the list Friday were given a special designation. It forces overseas suppliers to get a U.S. license that's difficult to obtain if they want to ship to any targeted firms. The U.S. said it targeted nearly 400 entities and individuals for aiding Russia's war effort. Chinese state media said the Chinese regime's Ministry of Commerce would take measures in response. It said the sanctions were wrong actions made with Russia-related excuses. 
And former President Trump is in Detroit today to address National Guard officers and on the heels of the Democratic National Convention, Vice President Kamala Harris and Governor Tim Walz are heading over to the Peach State. NTD's Daniel Monahan reports on their visit and updates from the Trump campaign. Harris and Waltz will be kicking off a bus tour in Georgia on Wednesday, and the campaign says they will be meeting directly with voters. The swing through the state will conclude with a rally in the Savannah area on Thursday. Waltz will not be attending the rally. This will be the first time Harris and Waltz campaign in the battleground state together. A recent poll from Fairleigh Dickinson University released on Friday showed Vice President Harris with a seven-point lead over former President Trump nationally. An experiment within the poll showed race and gender play a big role. When voters were made to think about race or gender, support for Harris increased significantly. When voters were not prompted to consider race or gender, Trump led Harris by one point, 48 percent, to 47 percent. Harris's campaign said Sunday they have raised a whopping $540 million in the little more than a month since she began her race for U.S. president. That includes an $82 million surge that came in last week during the Democratic National Convention. On the Republican side, vice presidential nominee J.D. Vance says former President Trump would not support any federal abortion ban, speaking on NBC's Meet the Press. I can absolutely commit that, Kristen, and Donald Trump has been as clear about that as possible. I, I, Donald Trump wants to end this culture war over this particular topic. Vance says kitchen table issues are holding families down. This country has become too anti-family. It's too expensive to afford a house. It's too expensive yeah. to afford groceries. Donald Trump and I want to change that. And unless we get better leadership, we're not going to. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. responded to a letter issued by several members of his family who condemned his public support of Trump. Kennedy says his family is free to take their position and that many other family members of his are working on his campaign, speaking on Fox News. I love my family. I feel like... We were raised in a milieu where we were encouraged to debate each other and debate ferociously and passionately about things, but to still love each other. Kennedy refuted any suggestions he chose to endorse Trump out of revenge. The politician says that's like swallowing poison, hoping someone else will die. Kennedy says he will be actively campaigning for Trump and that he and the former president agree on important issues like children's health. We need in this country to reach a point where we love our children more than we hate each other. And rooting out what he calls corruption in federal medicine and food regulation agencies. The most profitable thing today in America is a sick child. Kennedy says if he's given the chance to fix what he calls the chronic disease crisis, the disease burden will lift dramatically within two years. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. loses his Secret Service protection. This after suspending his campaign in 10 battleground states and endorsing former President Donald Trump. Kennedy was granted the protection following an assassination attempt on Trump in July. Following the attack, Trump said that Kennedy should immediately get Secret Service protection. The presidential candidate had previously been denied protection five times by the Department of Homeland Security. With his campaign now scaled back, the Secret Service confirmed that Kennedy is no longer being protected. Kennedy remains on the ballot in 40 states. He's urging voters to back him in areas where he doesn't risk splitting the vote. Coming up, devastation in Alaska. A massive landslide leaves one dead and several injured. The aftermath and steps to prevent further tragedy. And NASA astronauts stranded on the space station won't be coming home until 2025. Find out who's stepping in to bring them back safely right after this break. Join us on NTD Good Morning because we want you to stay informed. Kickstart your morning with the latest you missed overnight. Right, and don't forget that inspiration. Absolutely, so let's shine some light on the good news too. Tune in every weekday morning to NTD News. Thanks for staying with us. Tragedy strikes in Alaska. A massive landslide claimed over uh, about one life yesterday and left three others injured. The disaster hit the coastal city of Hitchikon around 4 p.m., damaging homes, power lines, and infrastructure, and prompting a mandatory evacuations for affected areas. Two of the injured were hospitalized, while one was treated and released. 
Ketchikan's mayor says he's never seen a landslide this bad in his 65 years living there. Emergency declarations have been issued by both state and local officials. Crews continue to assess the damage and risks of further slides. Flash flooding in the Grand Canyon has claimed the life of a hiker. Her body was found yesterday. Arizona Governor Katie Hobbs activated National Guard troops to rescue tourists and residents of the Havasupai Indian Reservation. Meanwhile, Hurricane Hone moved slowly past Hawaii's Big Island, bringing 85 mile per hour winds yesterday. About two inches of rain fell in 90 minutes, setting off flash flooding in the Grand Canyon. One hiker was swept away and was missing for three days. The National Park Service says Chinoa Nickerson's body was found around 20 miles away from where she went missing. The NPS said Nickerson was swept into Havasu Creek without a life jacket. There is an ongoing investigation into the incident. Arizona Governor Katie Hobbs called up National Guard troops in a helicopter to rescue over 100 endangered tourists and residents of the Havasu Pai Indian Reservation on Saturday. In Hawaii, Hurricane Hone dumped a foot or more of rain yesterday. The rain caused the National Weather Service to cancel its red flag warnings regarding strong winds possibly leading to wildfires on the drier side of islands in the archipelago. The rain has caused flooding in poweroutage.us as over 17,000 are without power. No injuries or deaths have been reported. Looking ahead, Category 4 Hurricane Gilma is far east of Hawaii and expected to weaken into a depression before it reaches the islands. The National Weather Service said Tropical Storm Hector formed yesterday in the eastern Pacific with 45 mile per hour winds. Currently, the storm is too far away from Hawaii to pose a threat, but is also headed westward toward the islands. A SpaceX crew dragging capsule will bring home two NASA astronauts who have remained on board of the International Space Station for about 80 days. The space agency did a formal review on Saturday to decide whether Boeing Starliner was safe enough to return home with its crew or if SpaceX's air, uh, spacecraft will have to step in to save the day. The Starliner vehicle carried astronauts Sonny Williams and Butch Wilmore to the space station in early June. It suffered setbacks with helium leaks and thrusters. SpaceX is already scheduled to do a routine mission to the International Space Station carrying four astronauts, but the mission will now be reconfigured to carry two astronauts on board instead of four. That adjustment will leave two empty seats for Williams and Wilmore to occupy on the flight home. The change will push the duel's return to February 2025 at the earliest. Next, Dr. Anthony Fauci is recovering at home after being hospitalized with West Nile virus. The spokesperson says he's expected to make a full recovery. West Nile virus is spread through the bite of infected mosquitoes. Most cases are mild, but about 100 people die from West Nile vi virus infections each year in the U.S. About 1,000 Americans are hospitalized with the most severe form each year. There's no vaccine or specific treatment for West Nile. The heaviest virus activity is usually seen in August and September. Microsoft has announced the cybersecurity conference. The tech giant says it will be about steps to improve systems after the CrowdStrike global IT outage last month. Executives plan to meet with CrowdStrike and other security companies in September. The conference will be at Microsoft's headquarters in Washington state on September 10th. A CrowdStrike software update in July caused outages for more than 8 million Windows computers worldwide. Disruptions range across industries from major airlines to healthcare and banks. Delta Airlines said it cost the company more than a half billion dollars. Delta is now seeking damages from both CrowdStrike and Microsoft. Shareholders have also sued CrowdStrike. The company has lost about $9 billion of its market value since the outage. Americans will mark the unofficial end of the summer this Labor Day weekend. That means airports, highways and beaches will likely be packed. For those people going on road trips Thursday and Friday, the earlier the better. You want to avoid being on the roads during those peak rush hour times, especially the afternoon rush. So between 4 and 7 p.m. are the worst times to be on the roads those days. The TSA expects to screen more than 17 million people, a record for the Labor Day period. AAA says bookings for domestic travel are running 9% higher than last year. International trips are down 4%. According to transportation data provider Inrix, the worst time to drive on Thursday will be between 1 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. Motorists will want to avoid the road on Friday between 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. On Saturday, drivers will want to avoid the 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. window. According to Enrix data, 
The return trip Monday is expected to be rough all day. In Florida, people stocked up on storm supplies at a discount over the weekend. It marked the start of a sales tax holiday. Residents could prepare for storms as the state heads into the peak of hurricane season. NTD's Christina Corona has the details. During the disaster preparedness sales tax holiday, consumers can purchase items such as batteries, pet supplies, portable generators, and more without paying taxes starting Saturday, August 24th through September 6th. This tax break is part of a package approved by lawmakers and Governor Ron DeSantis earlier this year. Shoppers can save on taxes for various items, including reusable ice packs priced at $20 or less, portable radials, fuel tanks, and battery packs costing $50 or less, food storage coolers at $60 or less, tarps at $100 or less, and portable generators priced at $3,000 or less. The tax exemptions cover items such as wet dog or cat food priced at $10 or less, pet leashes at $20 or less, cat litter at $25 or less, pet beds at $40 or less, and over-the-counter pet medications, pet carriers, and bags of dry dog or cat food costing $100 or less. Items can be purchased at most stores or online to qualify for the sales tax exemption. Hurricane season typically intensifies in mid-August, peaking around September 10th. This year, experts predict an above-average season with over 20 named storms expected by November. Christina Corona, NTD News. Australian employees can now ignore their bosses outside work hours, and that's thanks to a new right to disconnect. It's designed to curb the creep of emails and calls into personal life. Here's a closer look at that. In Australia, workers are now legally protected if they ignore their bosses after work hours. A new right to disconnect law came into force on Monday, designed to protect their personal time from work emails and calls. The rule ensures that employees, in most cases, cannot be punished for refusing to read or respond to contact from their employers outside of working hours. And for bosses or companies that insist, authorities can intervene and even slap them with a several thousand dollar fine. Supporters argue the law gives workers the confidence to stand up against the steady invasion of their personal lives by work emails, texts and calls. Rachel Abdelnour, who works in advertising in Sydney, said the changes would help her disconnect in an industry where clients often have different working hours. Um, I think it's actually really important that we have laws like this. We spend so much of our time connected to our phones, connected to our emails um, all day. And I think that it's really hard to switch off as it is. Australians worked on average 281 hours of unpaid overtime in 2023, according to a survey by the Australia Institute think tank. They valued that time as worth some 88 billion US dollars. With this law, Australia joins about two dozen countries with similar protections, including France, which introduced its own regulations in 2017. While the law aims to support better work-life balance, it also recognises the need for emergency contact, allowing employers to contact staff when necessary. Still to come, brutal attacks in Pakistan leave over 60 dead. What's behind the violence and China's role in it all? And French news outlets are reporting that Telegram CEO Pavel Dorov was detained near Paris. His arrest is leading to concerns over freedom of speech. Hi, I'm Kelly Wright. We thank you for joining us and watching America's Hope here on NTD News. Bottom line is, I know you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. But let's give you some good news in the midst of the bad news. Watch us nightly right here on NTD News for a full dose of America's hope. Welcome back. Over 60 people were killed in Pakistan today. Separatists militant attacked police stations, railway lines and highways in Pakistan's province of Balochistan. Security forces then carried out retaliatory options, operations. It was the most widespread assault by ethnic insurgents in years. Separatists in the resource-rich southwestern province have been trying to se secede for decades. The region is home to major China-led projects such as a strategic port and a gold mine and a copper mine. 
The Baloch Liberation Army militant group took responsibility for the attacks. The group says the central government unfairly exploits Balochistan's gas and mineral resources. It seeks the expulsion of China and independence for the province. French authorities have reportedly detained a founder of the Telegram messaging app, Pavel Dorov. Many are saying this could have profound effects on free speech online. Take a look at this. French media reported Russian-born Pavel Durov was detained at an airport outside Paris Saturday evening. Durov holds French citizenship. Media reports he had been targeted by an arrest warrant in France. The encrypted app he founded, Telegram, has close to a billion users. It soared in popularity after the 2022 invasion of Ukraine. Users shared content on it from both sides of the war. Even government and military officials set up channels to disseminate information. French media said the warrant against Durov came because of a lack of moderation on the platform. They say it has been used to launder money, traffic drugs, and share child sexual abuse material. Telegram said Sunday Durov had nothing to hide. In a statement, the company called it absurd to hold the owner of the platform responsible for users abusing the platform. It said it abides by European Union laws. Russian media says the Russian embassy in France has demanded access to Durov. Several prominent figures took to social media to talk about the implications of Durov's detention. Retired U.S. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman who was a witness in former President Trump's impeachment trial, said there is, quote, growing intolerance for platforming disinformation. He also said ex-CEO Elon Musk should be nervous. Musk, meanwhile, reposted an account that referred to government censorship across the globe, writing, quote, dangerous times. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. said the need to protect free speech has never been more urgent. And now we have some short headlines from around the world. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz vowed to step up deportations and bring down illegal migration after three people were killed in a mass stabbing over the weekend. Investigators believe the attack in the western city of Solingen was carried out by a suspected member of the Islamic State terrorist group. Police said they were holding a 26-year-old Syrian man in custody yesterday. He reportedly turned himself in late on Saturday and admitted to the crime. The attack happened during a festival on Friday evening in a market square. Live bands were playing to celebrate the city's 650th anniversary. Italian authorities are investigating the sinking of a luxury yacht as a case of manslaughter. Six people, including British entrepreneur Mike Lynch, were killed when it sank off the coast of Sicily last week. Prosecutors said it was the behavior of the crew and the way the boat was handled that caused it to sink. This runs against the explanation that bad weather was responsible. Prosecutors say the investigation is not aimed at any one individual. At a press conference, one prosecutor said the people who died were likely asleep at the time of the storm. He said this is why they couldn't escape. Authorities cannot confirm why the yacht sank so quickly. A fire broke out at a tower block in the early hours today in East London's Dagenham. More than 200 firefighters were deployed to put the fire out. The London Fire Brigade said they rushed to the scene within five minutes of receiving the call. The London Fire Brigade said two people were hospitalized. The building was evacuated, but the search and rescue operation has been ongoing since this morning. The fire was declared a major incident, but the cause remains unknown. Ride-hailing platform Uber was fined more than $320 million in the Netherlands. That's for allegedly sending the personal data of European taxi drivers to the United States in violation of EU rules. The Netherlands data protection watchdog DPA said Uber failed to safeguard the data. The agency added that Uber has stopped the practice. Uber can appeal the decision, and if unsuccessful, it can file a case with the Dutch courts. Bulgaria will hold a snap parliamentary election on October 27th. President Ruman Radev announced that today. It's the seventh election in just three years. It comes after its political parties failed to agree on a coalition government. Radev said a caretaker government would be sworn in Bulgaria's parliament tomorrow until the new leader is elected. Coming up, Paris marks the 80th anniversary of liberation from the Nazis. One woman shares her memories of the aftermath of World War II. 
And the Paralympic flame arrived in France yesterday after 24 British athletes carried it through the Channel Tunnel. We'll return with that and more after this break. I'm Iris Tao at the White House, and we are NTD. Good to have you with us. The White House says it's working to avert an escalation after an exchange of strikes between Israel and Hezbollah. The Iran-backed terrorist group launched hundreds of rockets and drones at Israel yesterday. Uh, Israel's Military says about 100 of its fighter jets struck thousands of Hezbollah rocket launcher barrels. It followed with further attacks later in the day, and this comes after Israel killed a top Hezbollah commander last month in Beirut. He was accused of by the U.S. of orchestrating a 1983 bombing that killed more than 240 troops. Hezbollah says yesterday that the attack is the first phase of its retaliation. And high-level Gaza ceasefire talks are still underway. The Hamas delegation left in negotiations in Cairo yesterday. The terrorist group says it only wants to implement President Biden's earlier proposal for a deal. Meanwhile, the top U.S. general has started an unannounced visit to the Middle East. Entity's Jeremy Sandberg has the update on the U.S. response. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says the U.S. is working to avert an escalation of conflict in the Middle East. This after the Lebanese terrorist group Hezbollah launched hundreds of rockets and drones at Israel yesterday. Israel's military said about 100 jets preemptively struck targets in Lebanon to thwart a larger attack. Hezbollah's leader said the Iran-backed terror group was assessing the impact of its strikes. He said the group would respond another time if the result is not enough. This is not the end of the story. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu said yesterday, Israel's air defense has intercepted all of Hezbollah's rockets and drones. He said leaders of Hezbollah and Iran should know Israel's reaction was another step towards changing the situation in the north and returning residents safely to their homes. We are hitting Hezbollah with surprising thrusts. Three weeks ago, we eliminated his chief of staff, and today we foiled his offensive plan. Air Force General C.Q. Brown began his trip to the Middle East in Jordan on Saturday. Brown traveled to Egypt yesterday, hours after the Israel-Hezbollah cross-border exchange. Egypt's president warned a major conflict in Lebanon would threaten the security and stability of the entire region. Brown is visiting Israel next. He said a Gaza hostage ceasefire deal would help bring the temperature down if achieved. Iran has vowed to strike Israel after a top Hamas leader was killed in Tehran. The U.S. military has been bolstering its forces in the Middle East. The Abraham Lincoln Carrier Strike Group is in the region to replace the Theodore Roosevelt Carrier Strike Group. The U.S. has also sent an F-22 Raptor squadron and deployed a cruise missile submarine. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. The U.S. is now taking extra steps to protect its citizens in Israel. After yesterday's strikes, the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem issued a security alert warning Americans they should exercise caution. And as well, the emb embassy's alert noted that... Um, uh, the attacks often take place without any warning. It also stated that it's important to note the location of the nearest shelter, and U.S. government employees and family members might be ordered to shelter in place. Uh, and Russia today launching drones and missiles into Ukraine. That's as a Russian spokesperson says that Ukraine's recent offensive into the country will be met with a Russian response. Ukraine launched a surprise attack on the Kursk border region in Russia earlier this month. Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov today called the offensive a hostile action, saying Russia has to respond accordingly. Peskov dismissed media reports saying that there had been ceasefire negotiations between Moscow and Kyiv. He says the topic of negotiations is irrelevant right now after Ukraine's incursion. And Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky today said that Russia launched one of its biggest strikes on Ukraine yet. He said that over 100 drones and 100 missiles were fired toward Ukraine. Yuck. Like most previous Russian strikes, this one is just as sneaky, targeting critical civilian infrastructure in the majority of our regions, in Kharkiv as well, the Kiev, Odessa and western regions. Unfortunately, there are casualties. At least three people were killed in the attack. Thirteen others were wounded. The barrage reportedly began around midnight and continued into the early hours of this morning. 
The strikes affected 15 regions, more than half of the country. Zelensky says the missiles and drones caused a lot of damage to Ukraine's energy sector. He added that restoration works are underway. Ukrainian officials are again calling on allies to let Kyiv strike deeper into Russia using long-range weapons. They say that's to attack the places from which Russia launches its missiles. Reuters said a member of its team was killed in a strike in eastern Ukraine. It could not say if Russia was responsible. Here's the latest from the war. In a statement, Reuters said safety advisor Ryan Evans was killed yesterday after a missile struck the hotel where he was staying. Two Reuters journalists were being treated in a hospital. One of them was seriously injured. The news agency said it was urgently seeking more information about the attack and working with Ukrainian authorities. Evans was a former British soldier who had been working with Reuters since 2022. He advised journalists on safety around the world, including in Ukraine, Israel, and at the Paris Olympics. He was 38. In a statement, Reuters said, quote, Ryan has helped so many of our journalists cover events around the world. We will miss him terribly. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said the hotel was hit by a Russian missile. He suggested the strike was intentional. A regular city hotel was destroyed by a Russian Iskander missile, absolutely purposefully, in a thought-out way. Seven people were wounded and one died in this strike. My condolences to friends and families. And this is everyday terror which still goes on because Russia has the means to continue. The Russian Defense Ministry did not respond to a request for comment. Reuters was not able to independently verify if the missile that hit the hotel was fired by Russia or if it was a deliberate strike on that building. Speaking to journalists Sunday, Zelensky said former President Trump has signaled his support for Ukraine. The remarks came after Zelensky held bilateral talks with Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. During the war time, yes, we had one phone call. So I only had messages that he will support Ukraine and will do everything how to stop the war and uh, to do everything Ukraine be independent, European and, and free free. So that all messages I've got from him but, but di directly. On Sunday, Ukraine and Russia exchanged 115 prisoners of war. This marked the 55th swap between the two sides since the start of the war in 2022. The United Arab Emirates moderated the exchange. The country's foreign ministry said the UAE's efforts have facilitated the exchange of more than 1,700 prisoners. Ukraine said many of the liberated prisoners had severe health problems caused by their injuries. On the country's 33rd Independence Day set Saturday, Ukraine once again called for restrictions on using long-range western May weapons to be lifted. The U.S. has added more than 100 Russian and Chinese firms to a trade restriction list that's over their alleged support for Russia's military. About 40 Chinese companies were added to the list, along with 60 from Russia. Roughly 20 firms are targeted from other countries. Reasons for being blacklisted include sending U.S. electronics to Russian military-related entities and producing drones for Russia to use in Ukraine. Many of the companies added to the list Friday were given a special designation. It forces overseas suppliers to get a U.S. license that's difficult to obtain if they want to ship to any targeted firms. The U.S. said it targeted nearly 400 entities and individuals for aiding Russia's war effort. Chinese state media said the Chinese regime's Ministry of Commerce would take measures in response. It said the sanctions were wrong actions made with Russia-related excuses. French President Emmanuel Macron said paid homage to World War II resistance fighters yesterday to mark 80 years since Paris was freed from Nazi occupation. One woman recalls her wartime experience as a young girl in Nazi-occupied Paris. Let's take a look. The French flag was hoisted at midday at the base of the Eiffel Tower to mark the 80th anniversary of the liberation of Paris from the Nazis. On the morning of August 25, 1944, tanks entered Paris. At noon, the French flag flew on the Eiffel Tower in place of a swastika for the first time in four years. A group of firefighters dressed up as resistant fighters to honor those who were killed. Denise Barbillon was 11 at the time of the liberation. She remembers the dangers for Parisians even while the Germans were retreating from the city. While they were leaving, the Germans launched bomb wherever, and it was in my neighborhood, close to my school. I had a little classmate who was killed there. They destroyed the house. The Nazis were gone, but there were still problems. And afterwards, in 1944, we didn't have much to eat. We had to stand in line for everything, to find bread. We would take turns in the family to wait in line for milk. It was crazy. Everything that we did, waiting at the butcher shop. 
She saw Holocaust survivors returning to Paris in their concentration camp uniforms and looking for their former homes. I saw the prisoners, the people who were leaving the concentration camps, returning with their, not in pajamas, but an outfit with the stripes. I saw them returning and then looking to go back to their homes, to go back somewhere. She remembers seeing what were called shorn women being displayed in public. They were suspected of collaborating with Nazis and were paraded in the streets with shaved heads. I saw some women after liberation, the shore women in the Rue de Crume. It became a fashion school afterwards. I know where it is exactly, that fashion school. They came out of there and they were taking in a lorry to parade them around. Although she considers the liberation of Paris a joyous occasion, Barbion said the aftermath of the conflict left a sting in her heart. Next, a Paralympic flame arrived in France yesterday after 24 British athletes carried it through the Channel Tunnel. The flame was lit on Saturday evening in Stoke Mandeville, England, the birthplace of the Paralympic movement. Over the next week, 12 torches will travel across France, passing through 50 relay towns with the help of 1,000 torchbearers. The journey will culminate in Paris, where the flame will reach the Olympic cauldron in the Tuileries Garden. German doctor Sir Ludwig Gutmann organized the first competition for World War II veterans with spinal cord injuries in 1948 at Stoke Mandeville Hospital. The opening ceremony for the Paris 2024 Paralympic Games is scheduled for Wednesday. After a debilitating motorcycle accident, Australian chef Peter Lammer was told he would never work in his beloved kitchen again. But now he's helping others with disabilities return to the labor market with a device he and a friend designed. Austrian chef Peter Lammer is performing miracles in his Salzburg kitchen, and not just with the food he creates. He swings through his restaurant with ease. But after a motorcycle accident in 2010, his dream job was in jeopardy. After six years of surgeries, experts said he would never be able to work in a profession on his feet again. 2016 was the turning point in my life. That was when I said, I can't go on. Because everyone, all the experts, said that I would never be able to do a standing job again. And of course, I felt that in my feet. So the pain confirmed it all. He finally called on the help of his friend, an amateur metal worker, Bernard Tihi. The pair designed a C-shaped bracket with an adjustable seat which allows him to float on rails and turn endlessly from workstation to workstation. How can you move around with this device now? We have these rails that are mounted freestanding on the ceiling or above the workstation. Then we have rollers that run along these rails so that you can move around the entire area below. The first prototype was actually the signpost for me back to having joy in life and the future. I knew that things could only go uphill from then on, and everything else that the others said was not true. They checked me, and it's actually true because I've been sitting here since 2016, that's already eight years, and now I have my shop and my passion. The two friends believe their hanging seat system is one of a kind worldwide. They even decided against selling their patent for the device to keep the price affordable for those who need it most. With their company standing ovation and support from the Austrian government, they now help others with disabilities back into the labour market. That's such an ingenious idea. You know, I'm, I'm not one who actually needs one, but, you know, I would love to try it out. Uh, at the workplace, you know, just twirling around. That looks so fun. It actually does look like fun. I think so. <laughs> Wider applications for so many things, right? Yeah, exactly. All Get right. Get us one, please. <laughs> right. Placing our order. Next for breaking news and special reports, tune in to NTD. And watch us live at ntd.com slash live. Stay with us and we'll bring you more. Welcome to NTD News Today. And here are today's top stories. Israel and Hezbollah continue to exchange fire. We have more on the U.S. response to the escalation of conflict. Ukraine reports a massive missile and drone strike by Russia. Find out more about the damage has done to the country. Vice President Kamala Harris heads to Georgia with running mate Tim Walls this week. 
And Robert F. Kennedy Jr. responds to some family members criticizing his support for former President Trump. The latest on the presidential race. Devastation in Alaska. A massive landslide leaves one dead and several injured. The aftermath and steps to prevent further tragedy. Tensions between the Chinese and Japanese militaries are rising after a Chinese spy plane breached Japanese airspace. The latest developments in the situation. And Americans will mark the unofficial end of summer this Labor Day weekend. That means airports, highways and beaches will likely be packed. We'll let you know the best times to stay off the roads. This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Hi, good to have you with us. I'm Stephanie Cox. And I'm Dama. Speaking of Labor Day, uh, Steph, any plans? I sure do. I'm going to a picnic. Oh, are you? Uh, am I invited? Oh, well, I did invite you, actually. Do you remember? <laughs> oh, I'll have to. Um, actually, I don't, but I'll check my calendar uh, to see when that is. Good. All oh. invited. We're in New York City. Join us. Next up, we begin with the conflicts in the Middle East. Fighting resumed today between Israel and the Hezbollah terrorist group in Lebanon. And Steph, this follows a short-lived uh, calm after a heavy exchange of strikes. State media and witnesses reported that Israeli strikes targeted a Lebanese border village and an area of a coastal city. Later, Hezbollah announced that it targeted military surveillance equipment in northern Israel with an exploding drone. And high-level Gaza ceasefire talks are still underway. The Hamas delegation left negotiations in Cairo yesterday. The terrorist group says it only wants to implement President Biden's earlier proposal for a deal. Meanwhile, the top U.S. general has started an unannounced visit to the Middle East. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has an update on the U.S. response. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says the U.S. is working to avert an escalation of conflict in the Middle East. This after the Lebanese terrorist group Hezbollah launched hundreds of rockets and drones at Israel yesterday. Israel's military said about 100 jets preemptively struck targets in Lebanon to thwart a larger attack. Hezbollah's leader said the Iran-backed terror group was assessing the impact of its strikes. He said the group would respond another time if the result is not enough. This is not the end of the story. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu said yesterday, Israel's air defense has intercepted all of Hezbollah's rockets and drones. He said leaders of Hezbollah and Iran should know Israel's reaction was another step towards changing the situation in the north and returning residents safely to their homes. We are hitting Hezbollah with surprising thrusts. Three weeks ago, we eliminated his chief of staff, and today we foiled his offensive plan. Air Force General C.Q. Brown began his trip to the Middle East in Jordan on Saturday. Brown traveled to Egypt yesterday, hours after the Israel-Hezbollah cross-border exchange. Egypt's president warned a major conflict in Lebanon would threaten the security and stability of the entire region. Brown is visiting Israel next. He said a Gaza hostage ceasefire deal would help bring the temperature down if achieved. Iran has vowed to strike Israel after a top Hamas leader was killed in Tehran. The U.S. military has been bolstering its forces in the Middle East. The Abraham Lincoln Carrier Strike Group is in the region to replace the Theodore Roosevelt Carrier Strike Group. The U.S. has also sent an F-22 Raptor squadron and deployed a cruise missile submarine. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. We turn now to the Russia-Ukraine war. Ukraine reported an attack by Russia involving over 100 missiles and around 100 drones earlier this morning. And Steph, it appears to be Russia's biggest attack against uh, Ukraine in weeks. The barrage began around midnight and continued beyond daybreak. Ukrainian officials say the strikes targeted areas across the country. At least five people were killed. Russia says the attack disputed Ukraine's disrupted Ukraine's electricity supply and the transportation of arms and ammunition to the front line. The strikes reportedly hit Ukraine's electricity substations, gas compressor stations, and as well as a reservoir near Kyiv. And Reuters says that a member of its team was killed in a strike in eastern Ukraine. It cannot say if Russia was responsible, though. Here's the latest from the war. In a statement, Reuters said safety advisor Ryan Evans was killed yesterday after a missile struck the hotel where he was staying. Two Reuters journalists were being treated in a hospital. One of them was seriously injured. The news agency said it was urgently seeking more information about the attack and working with Ukrainian authorities. Evans was a former British soldier who had been working with Reuters since 2022. 
He advised journalists on safety around the world, including in Ukraine, Israel, and at the Paris Olympics. He was 38. In a statement, Reuters said, quote, Ryan has helped so many of our journalists cover events around the world. We will miss him terribly. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said the hotel was hit by a Russian missile. He suggested the strike was intentional. A regular city hotel was destroyed by a Russian Iskander missile, absolutely purposefully, in a thought-out way. Seven people were wounded and one died in this strike. My condolences to friends and families. And this is everyday terror which still goes on because Russia has the means to continue. The Russian Defense Ministry did not respond to a request for comment. Reuters was not able to independently verify if the missile that hit the hotel was fired by Russia or if it was a deliberate strike on that building. Speaking to journalists Sunday, Zelensky said former President Trump has signaled his support for Ukraine. The remarks came after Zelensky held bilateral talks with Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. During the war time, yes, we had one phone call. So I only had messages that he will support Ukraine and will do everything how to stop the war and uh, to do everything Ukraine be independent, European and, and free. free. So that's all messages I've got from him but, but di directly. On Sunday, Ukraine and Russia exchanged 115 prisoners of war. This marked the 55th swap between the two sides since the start of the war in 2022. The United Arab Emirates moderated the exchange. The country's foreign ministry said the UAE's efforts have facilitated the exchange of more than 1,700 prisoners. Ukraine said many of the liberated prisoners had severe health problems caused by their injuries. On the country's 33rd Independence Day set Saturday, Ukraine once again called for restrictions on using long-range Western-made weapons to be lifted. Former President Trump is in Detroit today to address National Guard officers and on the heels of the Democratic National Convention, Vice President Kamala Harris and Governor Tim Walz are heading to the Peach State. Entities Dana Monahan reports on their visit and updates from the Trump campaign. Harris and Waltz will be kicking off a bus tour in Georgia on Wednesday, and the campaign says they will be meeting directly with voters. The swing through the state will conclude with a rally in the Savannah area on Thursday. Waltz will not be attending the rally. This will be the first time Harris and Waltz campaign in the battleground state together. A recent poll from Fairleigh Dickinson University released on Friday showed Vice President Harris with a seven-point lead over former President Trump nationally. An experiment within the poll showed race and gender play a big role. When voters were made to think about race or gender, support for Harris increased significantly. When voters were not prompted to consider race or gender, Trump led Harris by one point, 48 percent, to 47 percent. Harris's campaign said Sunday they have raised a whopping $540 million in the little more than a month since she began her race for U.S. president. That includes an $82 million surge that came in last week during the Democratic National Convention. On the Republican side, vice presidential nominee J.D. Vance says former President Trump would not support any federal abortion ban, speaking on NBC's Meet the Press. I can absolutely commit that, Kristen, and Donald Trump has been as clear about that as possible. I, I, Donald Trump wants to end this culture war over this particular topic. Vance says kitchen table issues are holding families down. This country has become too anti-family. It's too expensive to afford a house. It's too expensive yeah. to afford groceries. Donald Trump and I want to change that. And unless we get better leadership, we're not going to. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. responded to a letter issued by several members of his family who condemned his public support of Trump. Kennedy says his family is free to take their position and that many other family members of his are working on his campaign, speaking on Fox News. I love my family. I feel like... We were raised in a milieu where we were encouraged to debate each other and debate ferociously and passionately about things, but to still love each other. Kennedy refuted any suggestions he chose to endorse Trump out of revenge. The politician says that's like swallowing poison, hoping someone else will die. Kennedy says he will be actively campaigning for Trump and that he and the former president agree on important issues like children's health. We need in this country to reach a point where we love our children more than we hate each other. And rooting out what he calls corruption in federal medicine and food regulation agencies. The most profitable thing today in America is a sick child. Kennedy says if he's given the chance to fix what he calls the chronic disease crisis, the disease burden will lift dramatically within two years. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Flash flooding in the Grand Canyon has claimed the life of a hiker.
Her body was found yesterday. Arizona Governor Katie Hobbs activated National Guard troops to rescue tourists and residents ahead of the Havasupai Indian Reservation. Meanwhile, Hurricane Hone moved slowly past Hawaii's Big Island, bringing 85 mile per hour winds yesterday. About two inches of rain fell in 90 minutes, setting off flash flooding in the Grand Canyon. One hiker was swept away and was missing for three days. The National Park Service says Chinoa Nickerson's body was found around 20 miles away from where she went missing. The NPS said Nickerson was swept into Havasu Creek without a life jacket. There is an ongoing investigation into the incident. Arizona Governor Katie Hobbs called up National Guard troops in a helicopter to rescue over 100 endangered tourists and residents of the Havasu Pai Indian Reservation on Saturday. In Hawaii, Hurricane Hone dumped a foot or more of rain yesterday. The rain caused the National Weather Service to cancel its red flag warnings regarding strong winds possibly leading to wildfires on the drier side of islands and the archipelago. The rain has caused flooding in poweroutage.us as over 17,000 are without power. No injuries or deaths have been reported. Looking ahead, Category 4 Hurricane Gilma is far east of Hawaii and expected to weaken into a depression before it reaches the islands. The National Weather Service said Tropical Storm Hector formed yesterday in the eastern Pacific with 45 mile per hour winds. Currently, the storm is too far away from Hawaii to pose a threat, but is also headed westward toward the islands. Tragedy strikes in Alaska. A massive landslide claimed one life yesterday and left three others injured. The disaster hit the coastal city of Kitchikan around 4 p.m., damaging homes, power lines, and infrastructure, and prompting a mandatory evacuation for affected areas. Two of the injured were hospitalized while one was treated and released. Kitchikan's mayor says he's never seen a landslide this bad in his 65 years living there. Emergency declarations have been issued by both state and local officials. Crews continue to assess the damage and risks of further slides. So to come, Americans will mark the official end of summer this Labor Day weekend. That means airports, highways and beaches will likely be packed. We have that and more just after the break. Hi, I'm Kelly Wright. We thank you for joining us and watching America's Hope here on NTD News. Bottom line is, I know you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, but let's give you some good news in the midst of the bad news. Watch us nightly right here on NTD News for a full dose of America's Hope. Americans will mark the unofficial end of summer this Labor Day weekend. That means airports, highways, and beaches will likely be packed. For those people going on road trips Thursday and Friday, the earlier the better. You want to avoid being on the roads during those peak rush hour times, especially the afternoon rush. So between 4 and 7 p.m. are the worst times to be on the roads those days. The TSA expects to screen more than 17 million people, a record for the Labor Day period. AAA says bookings for domestic travel are running 9% higher than last year. International trips are down 4%. According to transportation data provider Enrix, the worst time to travel on Thursday will be between 1 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. Motorists will want to avoid the road on Friday between 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. On Saturday, drivers will want to avoid the 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. window. According to the Enrix data, the return trip Monday is expected to be rough all day. A SpaceX crew Dragon capsule will bring home two NASA astronauts who have remained on board the International Space Station for about 80 days. The space agency did a formal review on Saturday to decide whether Boeing Starliner was safe enough to return home with its crew or if SpaceX's spacecraft would have to step in to save the day. The Starliner vehicle carried astronaut Sonny Williams and Butch Wilmore to the space station in early June. It suffered setbacks with helium leaks and thrusters. SpaceX is already scheduled to do a routine mission to the International Space Station carrying four astronauts. But the mission will now be reconfigured to carry two astronauts on board instead of four. That adjustment will leave two empty seats for Williams and Wilmore uh, to occupy on the flight home. The change will push the duel's return to February 2025 at the earliest. Dr. Anthony Fauci is recovering at home after being hospitalized with West Nile virus. His spokesperson says he's expected to make a full recovery. West Nile virus is spread through the bite of infected mosquitoes. Most cases are mild, but about 100 people die from West Nile infections each year in the U.S. 
About 1,000 Americans are hospitalized with the most severe form of it each year. There's no vaccine or specific treatment for West Nile. The heaviest virus activity is usually seen in August and September. As the real estate industry is adapting to new rules, agents and buyers are still figuring out how to adjust. Here's this story. Before, buyers' agents were in high demand because the home seller paid the agent. But now, the buyer is supposed to negotiate with and pay their agent themselves. The new rule is creating confusion. It's best described as you're trying to change the oil of the car while the car is still moving. Um, no one is particularly too clear on what these, quote, rules and regulations are. Broker Cindy Scholes focuses on New York City and the Hamptons. She says many in the industry aren't sure how to proceed. It was actually quite odd to work with a client without having an agreement. Someone would just, you know, you're going around with them. You have no idea what your actual structure is. Scholes says she thinks 30 percent of buyers will leave the industry. Buyers reps have to work harder than ever. They have to deliver more value. Peter Gray is the president of Pyramid Real Estate Group, a group that includes buyers' agents. He says his firm had to do more work consulting lawyers and revising contracts. He says from now on, buyers' agents will have to be very sophisticated to be successful because they'll have to persuade buyers to pay for their service. They've created larger surveys and they've brought to the table more analytics and they're demonstrating to the buyer all the different options, the pluses and the minuses, and showing also off-market listings. Gray believes buyers should still get agents because they do provide real value. But he does see many buyers skipping the agent since the new rule. It might eliminate buyers agents from the market in a lot of ways right if it's if buyers know they have to pay commission to an agent for being a buyer they might just not be a buyer real estate investor dutch mendenhall works with real estate agents every day he says he's always negotiated with agents directly in florida people stocked up on storm supplies at the discount over the weekend it marked the start of a sales tax holiday Residents could prepare for storms as the state heads into the peak of hurricane season. NTD's Christina Corona has the details. During the disaster preparedness sales tax holiday, consumers can purchase items such as batteries, pet supplies, portable generators, and more without paying taxes starting Saturday, August 24th through September 6th. This tax break is part of a package approved by lawmakers and Governor Ron DeSantis earlier this year. Shoppers can save on taxes for various items, including reusable ice packs priced at $20 or less, portable radials, fuel tanks, and battery packs costing $50 or less, food storage coolers at $60 or less, tarps at $100 or less, and portable generators priced at $3,000 or less. The tax exemptions cover items such as wet dog or cat food priced at $10 or less, pet leashes at $20 or less, cat litter at $25 or less, pet beds at $40 or less, and over-the-counter pet medications, pet carriers, and bags of dry dog or cat food costing $100 or less. Items can be purchased at most stores or online to qualify for the sales tax exemption. Hurricane season typically intensifies in mid-August, peaking around September 10th. This year, experts predict an above-average season with over 20 named storms expected by November. Christina Corona, NTD News. Next, it's like winter during summer on Mount Rainier in Washington State. Officials there say an unusually cold weather system brought snow over the weekend. The cold system from the Gulf of Alaska moved through the Pacific Northwest into Northern California. The weather system brought some rare August snow along California's Sierra Nevada peaks. The last time it snowed in August on the Sierra Nevada crest was in 2003. The start of ski season is at least several months away, but resorts in the region still welcome the fresh summertime snow. Walmart is recalling an apple juice product nationwide because of elevated levels of arsenic. It applies to nearly 10,000 cases of the Great Value brand. The Food and Drug Administration made the announcement on their website on Friday. The brand is sold in 25 states, as well as in Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia. The recall was issued after discovering that the arsenic levels were higher than what is considered safe. Slightly elevated levels might cause temporary health issues like stomach pain, vomiting, diarrhea, and muscle cramping. It's not likely to cause serious or permanent harm, the juice was made by Dutch manufacturer Fresco Beverages, which has its U.S. headquarters in Florida.
Coming up, Canada is imposing a tariff on imports of Chinese-made electric vehicles. Ottawa also says it's targeting Chinese steel and aluminum. And thanks to a new law, Australian employees are now legally protected if they ignore their bosses after work hours. That and more when we return with NTD News. We're in the nation's capital asking the important questions so that you're in the know. Join us daily, Monday through Friday, on the Capitol Report on NTD News. Welcome back. The captain of the super yacht that sank in a storm off the coast of Sicily last week is now under investigation. That's according to an announcement today by the Italian prosecutor's office. The tragedy led to the deaths of British tech millionaire Mike Lynch and six others. Here's the latest. 51-year-old New Zealand national James Cutfield is being investigated for manslaughter and shipwreck. Being placed under investigation in Italy does not imply guilt and does not mean formal charges will necessarily follow. The decision was made after Cutfield was interrogated for a second time. The British flag Basian super yacht was carrying 22 people when it capsized and sank within minutes of being hit by a fierce storm. It killed Lynch, his 18-year-old daughter, and five other people. Fifteen people survived, including Lynch's wife. Cutfield and his eight surviving crew members have made no public comment yet on the disaster. Meanwhile, French authorities have reportedly detained a founder of the Telegram messaging app, Pavel Durov. French President Macron said today the arrest is part of an ongoing judicial investigation and there was no political motive. But many are saying this could have profound effects on free speech online. Take a look. French media reported Russian-born Pavel Durov was detained at an airport outside Paris Saturday evening. Durov holds French citizenship. Media reports he had been targeted by an arrest warrant in France. The encrypted app he founded, Telegram, has close to a billion users. It soared in popularity after the 2022 invasion of Ukraine. Users shared content on it from both sides of the war. Even government and military officials set up channels to disseminate information. French media said the warrant against Durov came because of a lack of moderation on the platform. They say it has been used to launder money, traffic drugs, and share child sexual abuse material. Telegram said Sunday Durov had nothing to hide. In a statement, the company called it absurd to hold the owner of the platform responsible for users abusing the platform. It said it abides by European Union laws. Russian media says the Russian embassy in France has demanded access to Durov. Several prominent figures took to social media to talk about the implications of Durov's detention. Retired U.S. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman who was a witness in former President Trump's impeachment trial, said there is, quote, growing intolerance for platforming disinformation. He also said ex-CEO Elon Musk should be nervous. Musk, meanwhile, reposted an account that referred to government censorship across the globe, writing, quote, dangerous times. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. said the need to protect free speech has never been more urgent. And now we have some short headlines from around the world. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz vowed to step up deportations and bring down illegal immigration after three people were killed in a mass stabbing over the weekend. Investigators believe the attack in the western city of Solingen was carried out by a suspected member of the Islamic State terrorist group. Police said they were holding a 26-year-old Syrian man in custody yesterday. He reportedly turned himself in late on Saturday and admitted to the crime. The attack happened during a festival on Friday evening in a market square. Live bands were playing to celebrate the city's 650-year history. A fire broke out at a tower block in the early hours today in East London's Dagenham. More than 200 firefighters were deployed to put out the fire. The London Fire Brigade said they rushed to the scene within five minutes of receiving the call. The London Fire Brigade said two people were hospitalized. The building was evacuated, but the search and rescue operation has been ongoing since this morning. The fire was declared a major incident, but the cause remains unknown. Ride-hailing platform Uber was fined more than $320 million in the Netherlands. That's for allegedly sending the personal data of European taxi drivers the United States in violation of EU rules. 
The Netherlands Data Protection Watchdog, DPA, said Uber failed to safeguard the data. The agency added that Uber has stopped the practice. Uber can appeal the decision, and if unsuccessful, it can file a case with the Dutch courts. The U.S. has added more than 100 Russian and Chinese firms to a trade restriction list. That's over their alleged support for Russia's military. About 40 Chinese companies were added to the list, along with 60 from Russia. Roughly 20 firms were targeted from other countries. Reasons for being blacklisted include sending U.S. electronics to Russian military-related entities and producing drones for Russia to use in Ukraine. Many of the companies added to the list Friday were given a special designation. It forces overseas suppliers to get a U.S. license that's difficult to obtain if they want to ship to any targeted firms. The U.S. said it targeted nearly 400 entities and individuals for aiding Russia's war effort. Chinese state media said the Chinese regime's Ministry of Commerce would take measures in response. It said the sanctions were wrong actions made with Russia-related excuses. Canada is imposing a 100% tariff on imports of Chinese-made electric vehicles that matches U.S. tariffs. This initiative comes just weeks after both the U.S. and the European Commission announced plans to impose higher import tariffs on Chinese EVs. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau also announced today there will be a 25% tariff on Chinese steel and aluminum. This move aims to counter what Ottawa calls a clear effort by Chinese companies to generate a global oversupply. The Canadian Deputy Prime Minister said her government would ensure Canada doesn't become a dumping ground for Chinese oversupply. The only Chinese-made EVs imported into Canada right now are from Tesla, made at the company's Shanghai factory, and there are no Chinese-branded EVs sold or imported at the moment. A Chinese military aircraft breached the Japanese airspace earlier today. That's according to the Japanese government. Tokyo has now lodged a strong protest against Beijing through diplomatic channels. The Japanese Defense Ministry said it scrambled jets against a Chinese reconnaissance aircraft after it briefly breached its airspace this morning. Reconnaissance aircraft are used for monitoring military activities and collecting intelligence. The Chinese warplane reportedly entered Japanese airspace from the southwest. Tokyo said that an investigation into the airplane's motives is underway. It also confirmed that its vice foreign minister had summoned a senior Chinese diplomat to protest against the incursion and strongly demanded the prevention of future breaches. Meanwhile, Taiwan is holding exercises to increase readiness and deter a potential attack from China. Taiwanese troops practiced launching anti-amphibious landing missiles today. Troops fired wire-guided missiles at floating targets off a beach in Pingtung County. The area on Taiwan's southern tip faces both toward the Taiwan Strait and China and toward the Pacific Ocean. The missiles are among the most effective and popular anti-tank weapons in the world. They're also a key component in what some experts say is Taiwan's best strategy to resist a potential Chinese invasion. North Korea is testing what are referred to as suicide drones. It's a type of weapon widely used in Ukraine and the Middle East. Here's a closer look. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un oversaw a test of homegrown so-called suicide drones over the weekend. That's according to state media on Monday, which released these images said to show Kim inspecting the drones on Saturday at North Korea's Drone Institute and looking on as they took off and destroyed test targets, including a mock tank. Also known as loitering munitions, they attack by crashing into the target with a built-in warhead. Such weapons have been widely used in the war in Ukraine as well as in the Middle East. The report said Kim urged researchers to develop artificial intelligence for the unmanned vehicles and called to ramp up production of suicide drones, including those that can be used underwater, as well as reconnaissance and multi-purpose attack drones. <laughs> South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said on Monday they were monitoring North Korea's military activities and were prepared for any provocations. When asked about visual similarities between some of the drones in the images from Kim's Saturday visit and those used and produced by Russia, a spokesperson said more analysis was necessary. Australian employees can now ignore their boss's outside work hours, and that's thanks to a new right to disconnect. It's designed to curb the creep of emails and calls into personal life. Take a closer look at this. In Australia, workers are now legally protected if they ignore their bosses after work hours. A new right to disconnect law came into force on Monday, designed to protect their personal time from work emails and calls. 
The rule ensures that employees, in most cases, cannot be punished for refusing to read or respond to contact from their employers outside of working hours. And for bosses or companies that insist, authorities can intervene and even slap them with a several thousand dollar fine. Supporters argue the law gives workers the confidence to stand up against the steady invasion of their personal lives by work emails, texts and calls. Rachel Abdelnour, who works in advertising in Sydney, said the changes would help her disconnect in an industry where clients often have different working hours. Um, I think it's actually really important that we have laws like this. We spend so much of our time connected to our phones, connected to our emails um, all day. And I think that it's really hard to switch off as it is. Australians worked on average 281 hours of unpaid overtime in 2023, according to a survey by the Australia Institute think tank. They valued that time as worth some 88 billion US dollars. With this law, Australia joins about two dozen countries with similar protections, including France, which introduced its own regulations in 2017. While the law aims to support better work-life balance, it also recognises the need for emergency contact, allowing employers to contact staff when necessary. Still to come, hundreds of plaques commemorate the liberation of Paris. The French capital celebrates the 80th anniversary of the end of Nazi occupation. And the capital of Lithuania hosted its third annual Corgi racing event over the weekend, drawing thousands of spectators. We'll return with that and more after this break. Want to know what's really happening around the world? Join us for a deep dive discussion with our expert panel on International Reporters Roundtable. Thank you for staying with us. Former President Trump is in Detroit today to address National Guard officers and on the heels of the Democratic National Convention, Vice President Kamala Harris and Governor Tim Walz are heading to the Peach State. NTD's Daniel Monahan reports on their visit and updates from the Trump campaign. Harris and Waltz will be kicking off a bus tour in Georgia on Wednesday, and the campaign says they will be meeting directly with voters. The swing through the state will conclude with a rally in the Savannah area on Thursday. Waltz will not be attending the rally. This will be the first time Harris and Waltz campaign in the battleground state together. A recent poll from Fairleigh Dickinson University released on Friday showed Vice President Harris with a seven-point lead over former President Trump nationally. An experiment within the poll showed race and gender play a big role. When voters were made to think about race or gender, support for Harris increased significantly. When voters were not prompted to consider race or gender, Trump led Harris by one point, 48 percent, to 47 percent. Harris's campaign said Sunday they have raised a whopping $540 million in the little more than a month since she began her race for U.S. president. That includes an $82 million surge that came in last week during the Democratic National Convention. On the Republican side, vice presidential nominee J.D. Vance says former President Trump would not support any federal abortion ban, speaking on NBC's Meet the Press. I can absolutely commit that, Kristen, and Donald Trump has been as clear about that as possible. I, I, Donald Trump wants to end this culture war over this particular topic. Vance says kitchen table issues are holding families down. This country has become too anti-family. It's too expensive to afford a house. It's too expensive yeah. to afford groceries. Donald Trump and I want to change that. And unless we get better leadership, we're not going to. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. responded to a letter issued by several members of his family who condemned his public support of Trump. Kennedy says his family is free to take their position and that many other family members of his are working on his campaign, speaking on Fox News. I love my family. I feel like... We were raised in a milieu where we were encouraged to debate each other and debate ferociously and passionately about things, but to still love each other. Kennedy refuted any suggestions he chose to endorse Trump out of revenge. The politician says that's like swallowing poison, hoping someone else will die. Kennedy says he will be actively campaigning for Trump 
and that he and the former president agree on important issues like children's health. We need in this country to reach a point where we love our children more than we hate each other. And rooting out what he calls corruption in federal medicine and food regulation agencies. The most profitable thing today in America is a sick child. Kennedy says if he's given the chance to fix what he calls the chronic disease crisis, the disease burden will lift dramatically within two years. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. French President Emmanuel Macron paid homage to World War II resistance fighters yesterday to mark 80 years since Paris was freed from Nazi occupation. One woman recalls her wartime experience as a young girl in Nazi-occupied Paris. Take a look. The French flag was hoisted at midday at the base of the Eiffel Tower to mark the 80th anniversary of the liberation of Paris from the Nazis. On the morning of August 25, 1944, tanks entered Paris. At noon, the French flag flew on the Eiffel Tower in place of a swastika for the first time in four years. A group of firefighters dressed up as resistant fighters to honor those who were killed. Denise Barbillon was 11 at the time of the liberation. She remembers the dangers for Parisians even while the Germans were retreating from the city. Well, they were leaving, the Germans launched bomb wherever, and it was in my neighborhood, close to my school. I had a little classmate who was killed there. They destroyed the house. The Nazis were gone, but there were still problems. And afterwards, in 1944, we didn't have much to eat. We had to stand in line for everything, to find bread. We would take turns in the family to wait in line for milk. It was crazy. Everything that we did, waiting at the butcher shop. She saw Holocaust survivors returning to Paris in their concentration camp uniforms and looking for their former homes. I saw the prisoners, the people who were leaving the concentration camps, returning with their, not in pajamas, but an outfit with the stripes. I saw them returning and then looking to go back to their homes, to go back somewhere. She remembers seeing what were called shorn women being displayed in public. They were suspected of collaborating with Nazis and were paraded in the streets with shaved heads. I saw some women after liberation, the shore women in the Rue de Crume. It became a fashion school afterwards. I know where it is exactly, that fashion school. They came out of there and they were taking in a lorry to parade them around. Although she considers the liberation of Paris a joyous occasion, Barbillon said the aftermath of the conflict left a sting in her heart. Staying in Paris, today hundreds of plaques commemorate the brutal fighting that took place during the liberation of Paris. Six days of clashes between French resistance forces and the Nazis would ultimately end four years of occupation. NTD's Xander Thomas has more on the reminders throughout the capital. The spotlight was on Paris this summer as it hosted the 2024 Olympic Games. Yesterday, the city also celebrated its liberation from Nazi occupation in 1944. But memorial plaques can be found throughout the capital every day. The oldest plaques date back to the days of the insurrection for the liberation of Paris. Often they were temporary plaques, a piece of cardboard, a slate. We find photos in the archives of these ancestors of the plaques that then became permanent plaques. New ones are still being installed today. V walked the streets of Paris over 18 months to find all of the plaques and uncover their history. The discreet reminders are found in the neighborhoods where the most intense fighting took place. Most mark the spot where fighters died, while others focus on notable events that marked the liberation. There are atrocious things that have happened where we live on a daily basis. We are aware of it, but it is a bit obscure. So the fact that there are these plaques, it still allows us not to forget to keep the memory alive, which is important in my opinion. The city maintains the plaques. They adorn the memorials with fresh flowers on May 9th, August 25th, and November 11th, all major dates in the two world wars. So even if the research is scientific work, they also move me enormously because I find out who the people whose names appear on these plaques are. So for me, these plaques are no longer pieces of stone or pieces of metal. I know the story every time I pass by, so I have a very emotional connection with these plaques. Paris is keeping the tradition alive, with new plaques to be inaugurated in the coming years.
Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And a woman from Suffolk became the UK's oldest skydiver at age 102. She celebrated her birthday by jumping from a plane yesterday. Manette Bailey describes her amazing feat. Well, I feel it's mission accomplished. And I haven't disgraced myself. When the door opened, I thought there's nothing more I can do or say. It's just jump. <laughs> well, I suppose I jump, but anyway, I remember my legs going out. And then it's a kind of blur. I shut my eyes. And we seem to travel at a very fast speed. Through her skydive, she raised nearly $12,000 for various charities. After her jump, Bailey was welcomed back with a celebration from the community. Many clapped her uh, cheer and cheered her on. Uh, she re received her skydive certificate along with some flowers. For her 100th birthday, Bailey drove a Favari racing car at 130 miles an hour. Lithuania's capital, Vilnius, hosted its third annual Corgi racing event on Saturday. The race drew thousands of spectators to Vignius Park, the city's largest open space. The event featured more than 100 Welsh, Welsh Pembroke and Cardigan Corgis from across Europe. They took part in the costume contest, a sprint competition, and a 50-yard race. The park arranged a track near a stadium, providing 6,000 seats for spectators to watch the proceedings. It began with the costume competition, where corgis appeared in various attires, very cute, and were judged through live public voting. This was followed by a main event, a 50-yard race, in which the dogs were classified by weight. The event organizer refuted the common belief that corgis cannot run fast due to their short legs. He said that corgis were agile and sporty because the breed was originally developed for herding cattle. And today is actually National Dog Day. It's a day dedicated to celebrating our four-legged friends. It's also a day when you can rough it up with your pup or visit a pet shelter and perhaps find a new furry family member. Let's turn to NTD's Rudy Ruiz for more. Dogs are America's favorite animal. According to the American Veterinary Medical Association, over 44% of American households own at least one dog in 2022. Nina Thompson, the Director of Public Relations at the San Diego Humane Society, shows us why many Americans choose to have a dog. Dogs are really human's best friend. They're so forgiving and their love is unconditional. And having a dog by your side is really a privilege. Today is also a day when people can visit rescue centers to adopt a dog. Adopting a shelter dog comes with responsibility, one that demands consistent attention to their needs. And according to Nina, it is all worth it. We get so much in return because they just follow us, they're loyal, and they love to be with their humans. Just like raising a kid, training a dog requires a specific methodology. According to Nina, it's important to only use positive reinforcement when training them. If you ever punish a dog, you're going to break the trust and you're going to break that bond and they're going to fear you. And so you really never want to use a hard hand with a dog when they do something good. Like Otis is being really good right here and he's being patient, so he's getting treats. Um, but never ever punish a dog for something that they did wrong. Just show them when they're doing things right. And if you see someone mistreating their dogs, there are always ways you can stand up for them. If you see something, we want you to say something. If you see animal cruelty, report it. Depending on where you live, um, there's an animal services provider in the city that you live, and they will investigate animal cruelty. And on National Dog Day, spending the day together is a great way to bond with your dog. Just like us, dogs are individuals, so it depends on if you have an energetic dog or a couch potato, but if your dog is energetic, take them on hikes when it's not too hot or take them to the beach. Um, some dogs just want to be next to you and lay on the couch and watch Netflix. Whether you're looking to add a four-legged creature to your family, need someone to protect you, or just like dogs in general, today is the day to appreciate and celebrate this amazing creation that God has made for us. Rudy Ruiz and Jimmy Ma, NTD News, San Diego. You know, on that dog race, I think the organizers knew exactly what were what they were doing, choosing corgis right. for the race with their uh, short little legs. Uh, and, and, and the costumes on top of that is just like the cherry on top. It's like cuteness overload. That is so true. I loved the costumes. That London bus, 
so sweet. And the little lamb, I think it was. Oh yeah, yeah. But you know, they actually, as we heard in the that coverage, they're actually bred for running fast. Mm, you know, they they, okay. they were bred to for cattle, herding cattle. Really. Um, but there is a fact that I learned about this, uh, which is the Pembroke Welsh Corgi in Welsh folklore is actually meant to said to be uh, something that pulled ferry coaches, worked ferry cattle, and served as a steed for ferry warriors. Oh yeah. So and you can see on on the fur that there's a little um, little like saddle marking for the ferries. So that's another aspect. Yeah. Whenever I see a corgi, that's exactly what I think of. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, not for me. <laughs> All right. Well, for Round the Clock original news coverage, watch us live at ntd.com slash live or download our NTD app. And if you have any feedback, please email us and be sure to stick around for NTD Newsroom at 2 p.m. We'll cover more stories from the U.S. and around the world. Welcome to NTD News Today. And here are today's top stories. Today is the third anniversary of the Kabul airport terror attack that killed 13 U.S. service members. Former President Trump is marketing the event at Arlington National Cemetery. Vice President Kamala Harris heads to Georgia with running mate Tim Walls this week. And Robert F. Kennedy Jr. responds to some family members criticizing his support for former President Trump. The latest on the presidential race. Israel and Hezbollah continue to exchange fire. We have more on the U.S. response to the escalation of conflict. Ukraine reports a massive missile and drone strike by Russia. Find out more about the damage it has done to the country. Hundreds of plaques commemorate the liberation of Paris. The French capital celebrates the 80th anniversary of the end of Nazi occupation. Canada's government imposes a tariff on imports of Chinese-made electric vehicles. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said today that the tax matches U.S. tariffs. And in baseball, Aaron Judge is at it again with two more home runs yesterday. NTD's Dave Martin joins us to discuss Judge's chances at another record. This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Hi, I'm Stephanie Cox. And I'm Don Ma. You know, Steph, I haven't spoken to Dave Martin in a while since starting That's this true. show. Yes, it's been a while. Also for me, because he was covering the DNC on our program late in the evening. Couldn't make it during yeah, the day. It's, it, it's going to feel like a sort of small reunion, if you will. Right. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I think <laughs> yeah, we're going to have some fun. Missing that sports news, so we'll bring that to you shortly. All right, today marks the third anniversary of the Kabul airport terror attack that killed 13 U.S. service members and over 100 Afghans. And former President Trump today is actually uh, laying uh, wreaths at Arlington National Cemetery to mark the event. Trump was joined by family members of the fallen service members. On August 26, 2021, ISIS-K suicide bombers carried out an attack near the gate of Kabul airport during the U.S. evacuation from Afghanistan. It killed at least 180 people. And just adding to that, Steph, in a post on Truth Social, Trump called the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, quote, the most embarrassing moment in the history of our country. Later today, Trump will travel to Michigan to speak at a conference of the National Guard Association of the United States. And next to the Middle East, fighting resumed today between Israel and the Hezbollah terrorist group in Lebanon. And this follows a short-lived uh, calm, if you will, after a heavy exchange of strikes. State media and witnesses reported that Israeli strikes targeted a Lebanese border village and an area of a coastal city. Later, Hezbollah announced that it targeted military surveillance equipment in northern Israel with an exploding drone. And high-level Gaza ceasefire talks are still underway. The Hamas delegation left negotiations in Cairo yesterday. The terrorist group says it only wants to implement President Biden's earlier proposal for a deal. Meanwhile, the top U.S. general has started an unannounced visit to the Middle East. And today's Jeremy Sandberg now has the update on the U.S. response. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says the U.S. is working to avert an escalation of conflict in the Middle East. This after the Lebanese terrorist group Hezbollah launched hundreds of rockets and drones at Israel yesterday. 
Israel's military said about 100 jets preemptively struck targets in Lebanon to thwart a larger attack. Hezbollah's leader said the Iran-backed terror group was assessing the impact of its strikes. He said the group would respond another time if the result is not enough. This is not the end of the story. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu said yesterday, Israel's air defense has intercepted all of Hezbollah's rockets and drones. He said leaders of Hezbollah and Iran should know Israel's reaction was another step towards changing the situation in the north and returning residents safely to their homes. We are hitting Hezbollah with surprising thrusts. Three weeks ago, we eliminated his chief of staff, and today we foiled his offensive plan. Air Force General C.Q. Brown began his trip to the Middle East in Jordan on Saturday. Brown traveled to Egypt yesterday, hours after the Israel-Hezbollah cross-border exchange. Egypt's president warned a major conflict in Lebanon would threaten the security and stability of the entire region. Brown is visiting Israel next. He said a Gaza hostage ceasefire deal would help bring the temperature down if achieved. Iran has vowed to strike Israel after a top Hamas leader was killed in Tehran. The U.S. military has been bolstering its forces in the Middle East. The Abraham Lincoln Carrier Strike Group is in the region to replace the Theodore Roosevelt Carrier Strike Group. The U.S. has also sent an F-22 Raptor squadron and deployed a cruise missile submarine. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. The U.S. is now taking extra steps to protect its citizens in Israel after yesterday's strikes. The U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem issued a security alert warning Americans that they should exercise caution. And as well, the embassy alert noted that attacks often take place without any warning. Mm -hmm. So, Steph, it is, it is also saying that uh, it's important to know the location of the nearest shelter. Uh, U.S. government employees and family members might be ordered to shelter in place. And now we turn to the Russia-Ukraine war. Ukraine reported an attack by Russia involving over 100 missiles and around 100 drones earlier this morning. It appears uh, to be Russia's biggest attack against Ukraine uh, in weeks, actually. The barrage began around midnight and continued beyond daybreak. Ukrainian officials say the strikes targeted areas across the country. At least five people were killed. Russia says the attack disrupted Ukraine's electricity supply and the transportation of arms and ammunition to the front line. The strikes reportedly hit Ukraine's electricity substations, gas compressor stations, and reservoir near Kyiv. And Reuters says a member of its team was killed in a strike in eastern Ukraine. It could not say if Russia was responsible. Here's the latest from the war. In a statement, Reuters said safety advisor Ryan Evans was killed yesterday after a missile struck the hotel where he was staying. Two Reuters journalists were being treated in a hospital. One of them was seriously injured. The news agency said it was urgently seeking more information about the attack and working with Ukrainian authorities. Evans was a former British soldier who had been working with Reuters since 2022. He advised journalists on safety around the world, including in Ukraine, Israel, and at the Paris Olympics. He was 38. In a statement, Reuters said, quote, Ryan has helped so many of our journalists cover events around the world. We will miss him terribly. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said the hotel was hit by a Russian missile. He suggested the strike was intentional. A regular city hotel was destroyed by a Russian Iskander missile, absolutely purposefully, in a thought-out way. Seven people were wounded and one died in this strike. My condolences to friends and families. And this is everyday terror which still goes on because Russia has the means to continue. The Russian Defense Ministry did not respond to a request for comment. Reuters was not able to independently verify if the missile that hit the hotel was fired by Russia or if it was a deliberate strike on that building. Speaking to journalists Sunday, Zelensky said former President Trump has signaled his support for Ukraine. The remarks came after Zelensky held bilateral talks with Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. During the war time, yes, we had one phone call. So I only had messages that he will support Ukraine and he will do everything how to stop the war and uh, to do everything, Ukraine be independent, European and, and free. Free. So that's all messages I've got from him, but, but di directly. On Sunday, Ukraine and Russia exchanged 115 prisoners of war. This marked the 55th swap between the two sides since the start of the war in 2022. The United Arab Emirates moderated the exchange. The country's foreign ministry said the UAE's efforts have facilitated the exchange of more than 1,700 prisoners. Ukraine said many of the liberated prisoners had severe health problems caused by their injuries. On the country's 33rd Independence Day set Saturday, Ukraine once again called for restrictions on using long-range Western-made weapons to be lifted. The U.S. has added more than 100 Russian and Chinese firms to a trade restriction list that's over their alleged support for Russia's military. 
About 40 Chinese companies were added to the list, along with 60 from Russia. Roughly 20 firms were targeted from other countries. Reasons for being blacklisted include sending U.S. electronics to Russian military-related entities and producing drones for Russia to use in Ukraine. Many of the companies added to the list Friday were given a special designation. It forces overseas suppliers to get a U.S. license that's difficult to obtain if they want to ship to any targeted firms. The U.S. said it targeted nearly 400 entities and individuals for aiding Russia's war effort. Chinese state media said the Chinese regime's Ministry of Commerce would take measures in response. It said the sanctions were wrong actions made with Russia-related excuses. And coming up, the Epoch Times will interview Robert F. Kennedy Jr. We speak to the interviewer for a preview of what to expect. Dr. Anthony Fauci is now recovering at home after being hospitalized with West Nile virus. Americans will mark the unofficial end of summer this Labor Day weekend. That means airports, highways and beaches will likely be packed. More in just a moment here on NTD News Today. Welcome back. Former President Trump is in Detroit today to address National Guard officers and on the heels of the Democratic National Convention, Vice President Kamala Harris and Governor Tim Walz are heading to the Peach State. Entities Daniel Monahan reports on their visit and updates from the Trump campaign. Harris and Waltz will be kicking off a bus tour in Georgia on Wednesday, and the campaign says they will be meeting directly with voters. The swing through the state will conclude with a rally in the Savannah area on Thursday. Waltz will not be attending the rally. This will be the first time Harris and Waltz campaign in the battleground state together. A recent poll from Fairleigh Dickinson University released on Friday showed Vice President Harris with a seven-point lead over former President Trump nationally. An experiment within the poll showed race and gender play a big role. When voters were made to think about race or gender, support for Harris increased significantly. When voters were not prompted to consider race or gender, Trump led Harris by one point, 48 percent to 47 percent. Harris's campaign said Sunday they have raised a whopping $540 million in the little more than a month since she began her race for U.S. president. That includes an $82 million surge that came in last week during the Democratic National Convention. On the Republican side, vice presidential nominee J.D. Vance says former President Trump would not support any federal abortion ban, speaking on NBC's Meet the Press. I can absolutely commit that, Kristen. And Donald Trump has been as clear about that as possible. I, I, Donald Trump wants to end this culture war over this particular topic. Vance says kitchen table issues are holding families down. This country has become too anti-family. It's too expensive to afford a house. It's too expensive yeah. to afford groceries. Donald Trump and I want to change that. And unless we get better leadership, we're not going to. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. responded to a letter issued by several members of his family who condemned his public support of Trump. Kennedy says his family is free to take their position and that many other family members of his are working on his campaign, speaking on Fox News. I love my family. I feel like we were raised in a milieu where we were encouraged to debate each other and debate ferociously and passionately about things, but to still love each other. Kennedy refuted any suggestions he chose to endorse Trump out of revenge. The politician says that's like swallowing poison, hoping someone else will die. Kennedy says he will be actively campaigning for Trump and that he and the former president agree on important issues like children's health. We need in this country to reach a point where we love our children more than we hate each other. And rooting out what he calls corruption in federal medicine and food regulation agencies. The most profitable thing today in America is a sick child. Kennedy says if he's given the chance to fix what he calls the chronic disease crisis, the disease burden will lift dramatically within two years. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. loses his Secret Service protection. This after suspending his campaign in 10 battleground states and endorsing former President Donald Trump. Kennedy was granted the protection following an assassination attempt on Trump in July. Following the attack, Trump said that Kennedy should immediately get Secret Service protection. The presidential candidate had previously been denied protection five times by the Department of Homeland Security. With his campaign now scaled back, the Secret Service confirmed that Kennedy is no longer being protected. 
Kennedy remains on the ballot in 40 states. He's urging voters to back him in areas where he doesn't risk splitting the vote. And now joining us is Jeff Lauterbach, reporter at the Epoch Times. Jeff, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. All right. So uh, you're going to interview RFK Jr. later this afternoon. Uh, just to give us a brief overview here, what are you looking forward to talking, talking to him about? Well, I've covered the campaign since uh, May 2023. He entered in April 2023. And I've interviewed him several times one-on-one -on -one and at events. And it's always wide ranging, those type of interviews. But this one particularly is about the children's uh, health, get, making uh, America healthy again and uh, battling the chronic disease epi epidemic and his commitment and passion about uh, children's health. Uh, are you going to talk to him about recent events surrounding his decisions and his family as well? Well, the main focus for this particular story, I'm doing a, a story on uh, what he plans to do with to fight the chronic disease epidemic and uh, focus on children's health. And that does tie in to why he made this decision to uh, leave the race in 10 battleground states and uh, back President Trump. And uh, President Trump has talked about if he wins, that Kennedy will have a role. He talks about the Make America Healthy Again. So he will uh, have a role, some role in the administration to tackle the chronic disease epidemic. And as well, I understand you've been speaking with RFK Jr. supporters since he dropped out and backed Trump. Uh, can you tell us how they're feeling as well? Well, it's interesting because... Um, Again, he entered the race in April 2023 to challenge President Biden for the Democrat nomination. And then he uh, received so much interference from the DNC that he ran as an independent in October of 2023. And since then, he's had ballot access lawsuit after ballot access lawsuit from the DNC. I was in Pennsylvania and New York covering his ballot access lawsuits last week and talked to uh RFK Jr. Uh, briefly about those. His supporters, they, they've they always uh, backed him because our, the bulk of people are uh, former Trump supporters, people who voted for Trump in 2020, and they have supported him because of his commitment to rooting out corporate corruption, what, he, what Kennedy calls corporate capture of federal agencies, plus they like um, Kennedy's stance on COVID and vaccine safety, and they didn't like uh, how Trump handled the COVID pandemic. So they have mixed feelings. They, uh, they want to see him to be able to tackle the chronic disease epidemic and root out corporate corruption. But there are people who are going to vote for Trump because as long as Kennedy has a role, but there are people who just won't vote for Trump because they don't like how he handled the COVID pandemic. Uh, I'm wondering if you can give us your best guess or estimate uh, as to uh, how many uh, supporters of uh, RFK will actually vote for Trump. Is it in the majority? Well, what's interesting is, um, according to uh, RFK Jr., internal polling showed that 57 percent of his supporters would vote for Trump if he dropped out or dropped out of the race. And it's important to note that he didn't drop out of the race. He suspended his campaign in 10 battleground states. But also, um, I talked to a Republican strategist in Ohio, Wes Farno, yesterday. He told me he believes Kennedy's endorsement of Trump will result in a 3% to 4% increase for Trump in those 10 swing states. Whereas David Carlucci, who's a Democrat strategist and a former New York state senator, said that he thinks it'll be neg negligible because uh, RFK had been losing uh, support, in his words, uh, RFK had been losing support and his support is split evenly among Harris and Trump. All right, let's, let, let me ask you a sidebar question here uh, while we're here. The Secret Service just said that it won't give protection to Kennedy anymore since he, uh, he suspended his campaign. So in your previous interviews with him, did he ever, you know, sort of express uh, if he was concerned at all with something happening to him? Yes, that's been a big issue since, uh, well, really about last October, even before when he was still in the Democrat primary, that was an issue. 
but then he when he ran as a independent because he's concerned there's been um his, his uh, security firm Gavin de Becker and Associates he hired uh, Gavin de Becker and Associates to provide security before he got secret service they had identified as many as 34 issues whether that be threats or potential uh, issues on his safety and of course you know most people uh, know that uh, RFK Jr is the son of Robert F Kennedy Senator Kennedy who was assassinated in 1968 while running for president and of course his uncle being John F Kennedy being assassinated in 1963 so his family has a track record of of danger facing that type of danger and RFK Jr is outspoken on issues that uh, uh, a lot of people don't like uh, he's a he's a threat to a lot of people so in return he gets uh he, he opens himself up to danger and he knows that so yeah he's concerned about he's expressed concern about his safety before and i'm not sure i'm going to try to find out if he's going to hire gavin de becker and associates again now that he no longer has secret service protection yeah, so I mean, give us maybe uh, your your guess as well on this. I mean, uh, without Secret Service protection, uh, what are his options next? Well, as far as protection, uh, I would say hiring his uh, Gavin De Becker and Associates. I, but that's speculation. I he has a long uh, relationship with them, and they provided. I've I've covered dozens upon dozens of events. And only a couple times did I cover anything with the Secret Service. Most of the time it had been Gavin DeBecker and Associates and their uh, high level protection firm for uh, executives and uh, notable figures. So he he's still going to be I mean, he's going to be actively campaigning for Trump and he's still on the ballot in those 40 states or as many as 40 states. So. The Secret Service responded to me yesterday, their communications director saying he's no longer a Secret Service protectee because he suspended this campaign, but he's still going to be, he's going to be campaigning for Trump. But the point is to note that, again, he didn't drop out. He's on the uh, ballot in as many as 40 states, so he's still in the race. All right, Jeff, a great conversation today. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So yeah, I'm I'm kind of looking forward to uh, what he's going to talk about with RFK Jr. It seems like he's going to talk about uh, health. Uh, that's a that's a main thing, uh, particularly children's health. Uh, he, he's he's going to talk about uh, potentially touch on his decision as well, RFK Jr.'s decision of dropping out uh, of the race. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this interview. That's right, Jeff Lauterbach, Epic Times reporter, uh, will be covering that and his. Uh, interview with RFK Jr. tonight. Um, so there was what he said also was the two kind of estimates of how much his supporters would uh, change their votes depending now with him dropping out of the race. He was saying RFK had said 57 percent of his supporters would uh, would support him, would support Trump. And uh, there was another estimate saying three to four percent or perhaps ne negligible. So that he may also touch on that being the latest development. But you also mentioned in this discussion that uh, RFK said, so he will find out, he's going to try and find out if he's going to get his own Secret Service protection now that that's no longer provided, um, some kind of private protection. Uh, but Obviously, he's still running, so there's there's a lot of controversies to cover with regards to yeah. RFK. Hopefully, seems we'll like hear there's about that. definitely some concern in uh, RFK Jr.'s mind uh, for his safety. Um, so yeah, it's it's good to uh, maybe we'll check in with uh, Jeff uh, at a later time after the interview to 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 see if uh, what's going to be the next step for, sure. for RFK Jr. For sure. All right. Next up. Dr. Anthony Fauci is recovering at home after being hospitalized with West Nile virus. His spokesperson says he's expected to make a full recovery. West Nile virus is spread through the bite of infected mosquitoes. Most cases are mild, but about 100 people die from West Nile virus infections each year in the U.S. About 1,000 Americans are hospitalized with the most severe form each year. 
there's no vaccine or specific treatment for West Nile. The heaviest virus activity is usually seen in August and September. And Microsoft has announced a cybersecurity conference. The tech giant says it will be about steps to improve systems after the CrowdStrike global IT outage last month. Executives plan to meet with CrowdStrike and other security companies in September. The conference will be at Microsoft's headquarters in Washington state on September 10th. A CrowdStrike software update in July caused outages for more than 8 million Windows computers worldwide. Disruptions ranged across industries from major airlines to healthcare and banks as well. Delta Airlines said it cost the company more than half a billion dollars. Delta is now seeking damages from both CrowdStrike and Microsoft. Shareholders have also sued CrowdStrike. The company has lost about $9 billion of its market value since the outage. Meanwhile, a SpaceX crew Dragon capsule will bring home two NASA astronauts who have remained on board the International Space Station for about 80 days. The space agency did a formal review on Saturday to decide whether Boeing Starliner was safe enough to return home with its crew or if SpaceX's spacecraft will have to step in to save the day. The Starliner vehicle carried astronauts Sonny Williams and Butch Wilmore to the space station in early June. It suffered setbacks with helium leaks and thrusters. SpaceX is already scheduled to do a routine mission to the International Space Station carrying four astronauts, but the mission will now be reconfigured to carry two astronauts on board instead of four. That adjustment will leave two empty seats for Williams and Wilmore to occupy on the flight home. The change will push the duo's return to February 2025 at the earliest. Americans will mark the unofficial end of summer this Labor Day weekend. That means airports, highways and beaches will likely be packed. For those people going on road trips Thursday and Friday, the earlier the better. You want to avoid being on the roads during those peak rush hour times, especially the afternoon rush. So between 4 and 7 p.m. are the worst times to be on the roads those days. The TSA expects to screen more than 17 million people, a record for the Labor Day period. Trip AAA says bookings for domestic travel are running 9% higher than last year. International trips are down 4%. According to transportation data provider Enrix, the worst time to drive on Thursday will be between 1 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. Motorists will want to avoid the road on Friday between 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. On Saturday, drivers will want to avoid the 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. window. According to Enrix data, the return trip Monday is expected to be rough all day. Former President Trump said he would hold a TV debate on another network. He made a stop today at Eden Center, a Vietnamese-focused retail complex. Listen. But when I looked at the hostility of that, I said, why am I doing it? Let's do it with another network. I want to do it. You know, I won because of debates. Uh, ask Biden. Trump today questioned whether he should even participate in the ABC debate, criticizing the network's coverage. Trump actually also said that he would prefer to have the mics on during this debate. Uh, but he added the agreement was that it would be muted as it was, first, uh, it was the first debate with President Joe Biden. All right, coming up, the captain of the luxury yacht that sank off the coast of Sicily is under investigation. The latest on the disaster that took the lives of British tycoon Mike Lynch and six others. And ride-hailing platform Uber has been fined over $320 million in the Netherlands. Dutch data protection watchdog DPA said the company violated EU rules. Taiwan ramps up military readiness with new anti-amphibious -amphib missile drones. Drills, more on how today's exercises are designed to counter growing threats from China. In just a moment here on NTD News Today. Thank you for staying with us. The captain of the super yacht that sank in a storm off the coast of Sicily is now under investigation. That's according to an announcement today by the Italian prosecutor's office. The tragedy led to the deaths of British tech millionaire Mike Lynch and six others. Here's the latest. 51-year-old New Zealand national James Cutfield is being investigated for manslaughter and shipwreck. Being placed under investigation in Italy does not imply guilt and does not mean formal charges will necessarily follow. The decision was made after Cutfield was interrogated for a second time. The British flag Basian super yacht was carrying 22 people when it capsized and sank within minutes of being hit by a fierce storm. It killed Lynch, his 18-year-old daughter and five other people. 
Fifteen people survived, including Lynch's wife. Cutfield and his eight surviving crew members have made no public comment yet on the disaster. French President Emmanuel Macron paid homage to World War II resistance fighters yesterday to mark 80 years since Paris was freed from Nazi occupation. One woman recalls her wartime experience as a young girl in Nazi-occupied Paris. Take a look. The French flag was hoisted at midday at the base of the Eiffel Tower to mark the 80th anniversary of the liberation of Paris from the Nazis. On the morning of August 25, 1944, tanks entered Paris. At noon, the French flag flew on the Eiffel Tower in place of a swastika for the first time in four years. A group of firefighters dressed up as resistant fighters to honor those who were killed. Denise Barbillon was 11 at the time of the liberation. She remembers the dangers for Parisians even while the Germans were retreating from the city. While they were leaving, the Germans launched bomb wherever, and it was in my neighborhood, close to my school. I had a little classmate who was killed there. They destroyed the house. The Nazis were gone, but there were still problems. And afterwards, in 1944, we didn't have much to eat. We had to stand in line for everything, to find bread. We would take turns in the family to wait in line for milk. It was crazy. Everything that we did, waiting at the butcher shop. She saw Holocaust survivors returning to Paris in their concentration camp uniforms and looking for their former homes. I saw the prisoners, the people who were leaving the concentration camps, returning with their, not in pajamas, but an outfit with the stripes. I saw them returning and then looking to go back to their homes, to go back somewhere. She remembers seeing what were called shorn women being displayed in public. They were suspected of collaborating with Nazis and were paraded in the streets with shaved heads. I saw some women after liberation, the shore women in the Rue de Crume. It became a fashion school afterwards. I know where it is exactly, that fashion school. They came out of there and they were taking in a lorry to parade them around. Although she considers the liberation of Paris a joyous occasion, Barbillon said the aftermath of the conflict left a sting in her heart. Today, hundreds of plaques commemorate the brutal fighting that took place during the liberation of Paris. Six days of clashes between French resistance forces and the Nazis will ultimately end four years of occupation. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more on the reminders throughout the capital. The spotlight was on Paris this summer as it hosted the 2024 Olympic Games. Yesterday, the city also celebrated its liberation from Nazi occupation in 1944. But memorial plaques can be found throughout the capital every day. The oldest plaques date back to the days of the insurrection for the liberation of Paris. Often they were temporary plaques, a piece of cardboard, a slate. We find photos in the archives of these ancestors of the plaques that then became permanent plaques. New ones are still being installed today. V walked the streets of Paris over 18 months to find all of the plaques and uncover their history. The discreet reminders are found in the neighborhoods where the most intense fighting took place. Most marked the spot where fighters died, while others focus on notable events that marked the liberation. There are atrocious things that have happened where we live on a daily basis. We are aware of it, but it is a bit obscure. So the fact that there are these plaques, it still allows us not to forget, to keep the memory alive, which is important in my opinion. The city maintains the plaques. They adorn the memorials with fresh flowers on May 9th, August 25th, and November 11th all major dates in the two world wars. So even if the research is scientific work, they also move me enormously because I find out who the people whose names appear on these plaques are. So for me, these plaques are no longer pieces of stone or pieces of metal. I know the story every time I pass by, so I have a very emotional connection with these plaques. Paris is keeping the tradition alive, with new plaques to be inaugurated in the coming years. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And now we have some short headlines from around the world. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz vowed to step up deportations and bring down illegal migration after three people were killed in a mass stabbing over the weekend. Investigators believe the attack in the western city of Solingen was carried out by a suspected member of the Islamic State terrorist group. 
Police said they were holding a 26-year-old Syrian man in custody yesterday. He reportedly turned himself in late on Saturday and admitted to the crime. The attack happened during a festival on Friday evening in Market Square. Live bands are playing to celebrate the city's 650-year history. Ride-hailing platform Uber was fined more than $320 million in the Netherlands. That's for allegedly sending the personal data of European taxi drivers to the United States in violation of EU rules. The Netherlands data protection watchdog DPA said Uber failed to safeguard the data. The agency added that Uber has stopped the practice. Uber can appeal the decision, and if unsuccessful, it can file a case with the Dutch courts. One person was killed after an ice cave in Iceland collapsed yesterday. The victim is part of a 25-member group that was in the area, made up of people from several countries. Rescue teams conducted an extensive search for two individuals believed to be trapped under the ice. Icelandic police have called off search today, saying no one is believed to be missing at this time. The nationalities of those involved were not immediately disclosed. Meanwhile, Canada is imposing a 100% tariff on imports of Chinese-made electric vehicles that matches U.S. tariffs. The initiative comes just weeks after both the U.S. and the European Commission announced plans to impose higher import tariffs on Chinese EVs. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau also announced today there will be a 25% tariff on Chinese steel and aluminum. This move aims to counter what Ottawa calls a clear effort by Chinese companies to generate a global oversupply. The Canadian Deputy Prime Minister said her government would ensure Canada doesn't become a dumping ground for Chinese oversupply. The only Chinese-made EVs imported into Canada right now are from Tesla, made at the company's Shanghai factory. There are no Chinese-branded EVs sold or imported at the moment. A Chinese military aircraft breached the Japanese airspace earlier today. That's according to the Japanese government. Tokyo has now lodged a strong protest against Beijing through diplomatic channels. The Japanese Defense Ministry said it scrambled jets against a Chinese reconnaissance aircraft after it briefly breached its airspace this morning. Reconnaissance aircraft are used for monitoring military activities and collecting intelligence. The Chinese warplane reportedly entered Japanese airspace from the southwest. Tokyo said that an investigation into the airplane's motives is underway. It also confirmed that its vice foreign minister had summoned a senior Chinese diplomat to protest against the incursion and strongly demanded the prevention of future breaches. Taiwan is holding exercises to increase readiness and deter a potential attack from China. Taiwanese troops practiced launching anti-amphibious landing missiles today. Troops fired wire-guided missiles at floating targets off a beach in Pingtung County. The area on Taiwan's southern tip faces both towards the Taiwan Strait and China and toward the Pacific Ocean. The missiles are among the most effective and popular anti-tank weapons in the world. They're also a key component in what some experts say is Taiwan's best strategy to resist a potential Chinese invasion. Coming up in baseball, Aaron Judge is at it again with two more home runs yesterday. NTD's Dave Martin joins us to discuss Judge's chances at another record. And for National Dog Day, Find out plausible play ways people can celebrate man's best friend with entities Rudy Ruse. That was a good one, Don. The capital of Lithuania hosted its third annual Corgi racing event this past weekend, drawing thousands of spectators to the city's largest open space. More in just a moment here on NTD News Today. Welcome back. Now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Uh, Dave, it's sort of like a reunion of sorts. Uh, <laughs> right. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Glad to be back on the show with you guys. Yeah, we haven't spoken in a while. So uh, yeah, plenty going on today. Uh, so let's start with baseball as Yankees uh, uh, slugger Aaron Judge hit a, a two more home runs yesterday and uh, to give him a, a league high of 51 on the season. Is there a sense that he could break his own record? I mean, there is now. He has been so on fire lately. You know, this is his seventh home run in his last six games, uh, his 10th home run in his last 13 games. He's now on pace to get 63 home runs, which would just be ahead of the 62 home run 
American League record that he set uh, two years ago. It was all part of a Yankees win over Colorado that now has them in first place in the AL East, the game ahead, game and a half ahead of Baltimore. Now back to Judge, the 51 home runs is the sixth most before September, and of course September is not done yet, so we could add to that total soon. Now if you're looking at the MVP race, it's really been between him and Kansas City's Bobby Witt, but I think Judge breaks his own American League home run record. You'd have to give the vote to Judge. But there's still, of course, at least 30 games left to decide this. Okay, now, Dave, when you talk about the home run record, you're generally just mentioning the American League and not the National League. You know, why is that? Well, technically, the National League record and Major League record is 73 home runs set by Barry Bonds back in 2001. That was three more than Mark McGuire hit a few years earlier and a few more than Sammy Sosa hit. I think Sosa had 66 one year. But none of those three players are in the Hall of Fame. Most sports writers suspected them of steroid use or drug use uh, during that time. Now, it's important to note those players never actually failed a drug test. But Major League Baseball didn't really test much uh, during that time. So because of that, the American League record is considered the clean record. But of course, there's no official asterisk next to those other titles. It's kind of taken with a grain of salt. It's really an unfortunate period in baseball history. Some sports drivers actually refer to it as the steroid era. Ooh. So Dave, you know, it's always great to hear your insight. So I'd love to ask you one more question here. Uh, and this is about tennis news. Uh, the U.S. Open begins today right here in New York. Uh, who are some of the favorites uh, to win? Well, on the women's side, you've got Coco Goff. She's a reigning champion, uh, won it last year. As an American, she will, all, she will benefit. She'll have the benefit of the crowd of being on her side. So she's kind of struggled a little the last couple of months. Certainly number one, number one ranked Iga Fiatek. She's always a favorite wherever she plays. Now, on the men's side, you still have 37-year-old Novak Djokovic, along with several other players who are actually much younger than him uh, that are going to be the favorites. Now, Djokovic won Olympic gold a few weeks ago, but it's been actually a down year considering he has no major titles. Uh, now Alcaraz, meanwhile, he's already won four majors. If he wins either this U.S. Open or the Australian Open in January, he'll be the, that'll set the record for most major titles won before the age of 22. He's off to a great start in his career. Uh, so I really think it's going to come down to Alcaraz against Djokovic. I really think even though Djokovic got him for gold at the Olympics, it really feels like Alcaraz is having a tough time against, I'm sorry, Djokovic is having a tough time against Alcaraz. So I think Alcaraz is going to win the title here. It does seem like there's a bit of a new era coming in tennis with, you know, the top dog. And it's kind of sad to see, but it's exciting as well, right? Yeah, you know, the, 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 the big three of Djokovic, Nadal, and Federer, or Federer's had to retire because of injuries. Nadal looks like he's about there, and players... At least this year, I have caught up, to ki kind of, to Djokovic. So, uh, yeah, it's a new era coming in. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll keep our eyes on that. Thanks so much, Dave, as always. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right, moving on. Today is actually National Dog Day, and this is a day dedicated to celebrating our four-legged friends. It's also a day when you can rough it up with your pup or visit a pet shelter and perhaps find a new furry family member. So let's now turn to NTD's Rudy Ruiz for more. Dogs are America's favorite animal. According to the American Veterinary Medical Association, over 44% of American households own at least one dog in 2022. Nina Thompson, the Director of Public Relations at the San Diego Humane Society, shows us why many Americans choose to have a dog. Dogs are really human's best friend. They're so forgiving and their love is unconditional. And having a dog by your side is really a privilege. Today is also a day when people can visit rescue centers to adopt a dog. Adopting a shelter dog comes with responsibility, one that demands consistent attention to their needs. And according to Nina, it is all worth it. We get so much in return because they just follow us, they're loyal, and they love to be with their humans. Just like raising a kid, training a dog requires a specific methodology. According to Nina, it's important to only use positive reinforcement when training them. If you ever punish a dog, you're going to break the trust and you're going to break that bond and they're going to fear you. And so you really never want to use a hard hand with a dog when they do something good. Like Otis is being really good right here and he's being patient, so he's getting treats. Um, but never ever punish a dog for something that they did wrong. Just show them when they're doing things right. 
And if you see someone mistreating their dogs, there are always ways you can stand up for them. If you see something, we want you to say something. If you see animal cruelty, report it. Depending on where you live, um, there's an animal services provider in the city that you live, and they will investigate animal cruelty. And on National Dog Day, spending the day together is a great way to bond with your dog. Just like us, dogs are individuals, so it depends on if you have an energetic dog or a couch potato, but if your dog is energetic, take them on hikes when it's not too hot or take them to the beach. Um, some dogs just want to be next to you and lay on the couch and watch Netflix. Whether you're looking to add a four-legged creature to your family, need someone to protect you, or just like dogs in general, today is the day to appreciate and celebrate this amazing creation that God has made for us. Rudy Ruiz and Jimmy Ma, NTD News, San Diego. Lithuania's capital Vilnius hosted its third annual Corgi racing event on Saturday. The race drew thousands of spectators to Vignis Park, the city's largest open space. The event featured more than 100 Welsh Pembroke and Cardigan Corgis from across Europe. They took part in a costume test, a sprint competition and the 50-yard race. The park arranged a track near a stadium providing 6,000 seats for spectators to watch the proceedings, so it was pretty popular. It began with the costume competition where corgis appeared in various attires and were judged through live public voting. What pressure! This followed by main, the main event, a 50-yard race in which the dogs were classified by weight. The event organizer refuted the common belief that corgis cannot run fast due to their short legs. He said corgis were agile and sporty because the breed was originally developed for herding cattle. Wow. You know, I, I, I just can't help but smile seeing the, the corgis so <laughs> racing cute, so with cute. their tiny little legs. So cute. And the costumes. I wish I, I was there. <laughs> the costume was just like the cherry on top. It was like so cute. For sure. Brings a smile to the face. 6,000 people showed up. That's I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. Possibly. I, I mean, the sta well. stadium looked pretty full. It so, did. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, for Round the Clock original news coverage, watch us live at ntd.com slash live or download our NTD app. And of course, if you have any feedback, please email us and be sure to stick around for NTD Newsroom at 2 p.m. Eastern. We'll cover more stories from the U.S. and from around the world. Sure will.